Good morning. One more week we've been uh, having to set aside our series in Romans because <clears throat> uh, Easter was the previous time I was here three weeks ago, then I was gone for two Sundays, today's Mother's Day, and I felt compelled to bring a message on the family. Um, you look around in the nation and the family's in disarray. And, and not only that, but the institution of, of motherhood and the institution of the family as a unit is, uh, is degraded and is, uh, is seen as a bad thing, is seen as perhaps um, something that will inhibit progress. And uh, the way to progress is to abandon all things and go pursue more money and grow our GDP and, and, and all of that. And we see these things. We're right now on the precipice of turning over, overturning Roe versus Wade before its 50 year anniversary. Somewhere in the ballpark of 70 million babies slaughtered over the past 49 years. And we see these things happening and you wonder what is the reason for it? Why is it this way? Why do you have people marching in the streets angrily protesting the decision of a court to say that it isn't and shouldn't be federal law that abortion is permitted. Leave it to the states. Even then I'd say we shouldn't even leave it to the states. It should be pro prohibited across the board. But <clears throat> what is it that's happening? What has happened that's led to this? I remember some years ago I was reading an article and the guy was talking about uh, this, this kind of the upswing of this trend that was happening on secular campuses all over the nation where you'd had these young people coming out of their homes, moving to these new cities and demanding safe spaces and really having, uh, really being very easily offended over a number of things and needing to kind of have a, a place where they didn't feel any kind of pressure, any kind of judgment, any kind of um, criticism from their peers or anyone else. It needed to be sort of an express place where that uh, safety could happen. And, and of course we would look and we'd say, what's the reason for the insecurity? And, and you, you rightly should say a young adult shouldn't be so insecure. Uh, we're going to be criticized. Everybody will be. Um, who cares what other people think? But that's a mature standpoint. So this guy was talking about um, the foundations, the two foundations of any society are faith and family, and it's been this way forever. Now this guy was writing, from, you know, he wasn't writing for particular Christian faith or any one faith over another. He was just saying foundations of any society through all of history that have led to uh, successful people, well-rounded people, confident people, um, was those two things, faith and family. And he went on to spell out how over the last several decades in our nation, we've stripped away at both of those. And so there's a whole generation that came out of a prior generation that had uh, deconstructed and chiseled away at the Christian faith, rendering it down to very basic couple of things, and chiseled away at what the family is supposed to be. And so they didn't have a faith, they didn't have a family, so what were they standing on top of? How could you be secure? You would need, you'd have a desire to have a place where you felt safe because you're kind of in a free-floating area. So, <clears throat> We're now, uh, I was watching a video the other day of a um, politician that was in front of the Capitol and she kind of had this crowd around her and they were uh, shouting that we will fight, we will fight, we will fight to uh, have the right over our bodies. Uh, 
This is where we are as a nation. Dave Rubin, political commentator, uh, who, who would be, some would call him a social conservative, certainly not a moral conservative. Dave Rubin recently announced that he and his partner, I won't go into any more details than that, are adopting two children. And there's a lot of praise from both the right and the left over this happening. What, is, what has happened? I always ask my boys, what is a marriage? And they have a uniform answer, one man, one woman, for life. That's it. One man, one woman, for life. That has been the answer for the majority of history. So what happened and what should the church do about it? Let me talk a little bit about what happened, which this is history. And then I want to give some constructive ideas going forward for what we can do about it. I do believe that we, the church of Christ, should be at the center of this as a beacon of hope and as a beacon of light and as, as an example to the world of a better way of doing things. As, as we're seeing the erosion that's happened from the way that we've broken down families, the church should be out there on the front lines showing what it means to really be a biblical Christian family, a way that works, a way that produces good thinking, well-rounded people who are productive and industrious and do good for society. Here's what happened. This is a very short breakdown of it. But this is from, this history is painted in a, a book um, called um, The Household and the War for the Cosmos by a scholar named C.R. Wiley. And he starts all the way back, because you know, he, he paints this picture of just the erosion of the family. You know, it's no longer one man and one woman, it's one man with whomever. Uh, it's no longer about producing children and nurturing children, raising them up to be successful. It's if they're in your way, you have the right for at least nine months to end their life so that you can continue on your career path or whatever it may be. And he points, he paints this idea of what's happened, you know, divorces and all of this. And he goes back to the Industrial Revolution. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, the economy literally was a mother and father and their children. And they had their own economy. They were a unit. And dads were always present and nearby. They may be working out in the shop or working out in the field, but they were always very close so that if the little boys had been uh, naughty and disobeying mom, they could come in and discipline. And mom was always nearby to give instruction and to pass on values and morals and ethics and to read to them and to teach them the things that actually will matter going forward. And the children were brought into this, and it was expected of them that you will be an industrious part of this family. You will work. As soon as you're able, you will work. You will be out there with us. And fathers would mentor their boys, showing them how to be men, how to be strong, how to deal with pain, how to suffer through sweat. Young girls were taught by their mothers how to live a godly and dignified life. It was just the way that it was. And it was really this way for, at least from the sense of the family being a unit, it was this way for pretty much all of human history. We look around in a world right now where the family is, is scattered. Mom and dad are two different places, kids are in a different place. We, we look at these things somewhat ignorant of history, and we think this is just the way that it is, this is the way it's always been. But it hasn't always been that way. What we need to do is we need to look to the fruit of what has come of doing it that way. We have to be honest enough to say, are we standing in a better point as a society because of how we've done this? See, the Industrial Revolution came along and men were then called to factories and they left their homes. They were no longer there to be instructive to their boys, working very long shifts to be instructive to their daughters. 
This went on for a long time, and then the women saw that the men were having all the fun. They were managing absolutely everything at the house. The men were gone, and so this rose feminism. And it began as an initial desire for equality, but we can see the ways that it's worked itself out. And it's led to all kinds of degradations of the family as mom and dad went to separate places. As they were separate places, the kids had to go elsewhere. This is when we started to see a, a rise in um, care homes and you know, the elderly no longer being cared for by families, but being cared for by others. This is what has happened. And in the pursuit of the careers that went two different directions, directly out of that, directly out of this idea that growing the GDP and pursuing a dream that's economic, Roe versus Wade, came very naturally through it. Because the women in the pursuit of their careers saw that these young children stood in the way, their inconveniences. What can we do? I, I ought to be able to have the right, so long as it's in my body, to remove this body from my body, to end its life. That's exactly what happened. It's a dark image. You think about when the scriptures say that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It bears itself out in all of these different kinds of ways. <clears throat> I was reading an article um, recently in uh, First Things, which is a kind of, it, it's public commentary. And the author was, was talking about Tim Keller. Now, Tim Keller is a, a pastor of great notoriety. He's been uh, the lead pastor of a Presbyterian Church in New York City since the late 80s. You've probably heard his name. He, he, he's kind of been at the center of a lot of um, big social commentary from a theological perspective for, for the last 30 years. Well, this author of this article was talking about Tim Keller and how much he had influenced him in his early years in the Christian faith. And one of the things that's notable about Tim Keller is that he believes and has presented himself, has postured himself theologically from the standpoint of being very winsome and very apologetic in his approach. The idea was, don't ever say anything that could leave somebody a little bit chafed. Don't, don't do anything that's going to make someone a little uncomfortable or maybe rub them the wrong way. So he, he, he presented his faith from an apologetic angle, not, not like me saying sorry to someone for wronging them, but the classic apology of let me defend, let me show you why Christianity is the better way. And of course, there's value in that. And there's a time and a place for that. To not be offensive, but to be very defensive. To present the faith from a defensive standpoint, to say this is what it is. But this guy was talking about how when, when Keller began his ministry, the general disposition and attitude of America toward the church was this. It was neutral. There's a great deal of neutrality. It was people didn't really have anything against the church, and people really weren't fired up about being a part of the church. This is postmodernism. It we came out of all the, you know, the high points of postmodernism, and we came out on the other side, just kind of being uncertain, and people just really in limbo, not knowing. And so in a culture like that, it did a great deal of good. They, that church grew from 50 to 5,000 in a pretty quick number of years. Just going out and being defensive of the Christian faith. Very winsome. Very gentle in the approach. But the author of this article was talking about how we're in a different period now. The culture around us is no longer, are we aware of this? This culture around us is no longer neutral toward the Christian faith. Actually, if you pay attention to social commentary, they're antagonistic of it. In fact, there are um, scholarly pieces that are put out all the time 
that speak of the church as being bad for society. See, we're the object of derision. We're under scorn. We're under scrutiny. And so there's a, there's a tax actually coming at us. This guy was saying, we're in a different point now. Being totally winsome and apologetic may not work. And he gave this case in point. Back in 2017, the Kepper Center for Public Theology, which holds uh, an award ceremony every year at Princeton Theological Seminary, had nominated and had chosen that Tim Keller would be their recipient for their prize for excellence in reformed theology and public witness. This Kepper Center for Public Theology noted what Keller had done in being a public witness for Jesus and the growth that he had brought for Jesus for all of these years. And so they said, you're the recipient of this award. But the faculty and staff at Princeton, uh, faculty, staff, and students at Princeton Theological Cere uh, Seminary, where this was going to be held, where the award ceremony was going to be held, pushed back very hard against it. They said that they wouldn't stand for it because Tim Keller did not embrace a lot of the progressive ideals on sex and gender. So here's a guy who for nearly 30 years at this point had been winsome and totally gentle and apologetic and defensive and just never was on the offense with what he did in the faith. And even despite that, they still rejected it. Said, we will not have anything to do with this. So I'm proposing a different way. I'm proposing, I'm proposing a method that comes straight out of Scripture, right from the writings of the Apostle Paul. You see it generally if you go over to the book of Ephesians when Paul says, you know, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. The whole armor of God is, is not just a shield. The Christian faith isn't just a shield. He says, take up the first thing he says, take up the sword of the spirit and then the shield of the faith. There's defense, but there's also offense. Now, historically, you may have had Christians that, that broke this down in the wrong way. And Christians might have gone to fight in physical battles with physical swords. I'm not saying that. But this is what Paul does say of the sword. He says to the Corinthian Christians, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. If you read the writings of Paul, Paul would make the case that most of philosophy, most of select, secular philosophy, the ideas that are presented and brought out in culture, most of these things that we just ingest, that we hear in our um, seminaries, that we hear in our colleges, that we hear in our schools, that we hear on the street, Paul would argue that most of those ideas that come out of the world actually have a demonic backing. And that there's an enemy behind them who's presenting these plausible arguments that convince people of, of things that are anti-truth. And so Paul is saying the Christian has to actually take up the sword of the Spirit. And there is a time to be offensive. You're not intentionally trying to chafe or rub someone the wrong way. But we have to be public about what we believe and we have to be ready to defend that. About 1,300 years ago, the Germanic people, so go over to Germany. They weren't called Germans at the time. 1,300 years ago, somewhere in the 700s, the Germanic people were 
harsh, barbaric, um, worshiping Nordic gods. These were pagans. They were worshiping Thor and Odin and all of those gods that we just kind of know by name today. And there was a Benedictine monk named Boniface who went there. And he went right into the city center. And he saw that in the city center, they had this giant oak tree that was dedicated to Thor. It was called Thor's Oak. And this tree was sort of the center of their uh, ritual and worship and the things that they would bring before Thor. Well, this Christian monk went right into the city center with an axe in hand. And he told the people there, the Germanic pagans, that he intended to bring down that tree so that they might know that Jesus is the true Christ. And the people scoffed at him. And they laughed. Because they knew Thor will not allow you to break so much as a twig from this tree. And yet he went in boldly, took the axe to the base of the tree, and one chip after the next, one blow after the next, ultimately felled the tree. The people bowed their knee to Christ because they recognized Thor must be no god at all. In Christian theology, this is called the Boniface option. It isn't for always, it isn't for every circumstance, but it is for times such as this, when the world needs to know where Christians stand. And we cannot be ashamed of it. There are ideas that are circulating in our nation. Do we love the family? Do we truly love children? Do we truly love the way of God? Will we present the ancient truths, the old paths, the things that for thousands of generations actually worked for the family? Or will we pursue continuously after the things that culture and society has told us are good, but that we've seen time and time again are not good? Marriage has been completely destroyed in this nation. Husbands are not faithful to wives. Wives are not faithful to husbands. They leave. Children are raised in broken homes. So I want to read some scriptures concerning the family, and then I want to finish with a challenge. This is uh, the word of the Lord, and as I was preparing this message and getting ready to read these scriptures, it makes me a little nervous. And I thought, why would I be nervous of this? This is right out of the Bible. And the reason why is because I do believe that many Christians, though they don't know it, are opposed to some of the very ideas that the Bible expressly presents concerning the family structure and the family unit. But this is the word of the Lord. And I'm just going to read these scriptures with very little commentary on them. And then I want to give some challenges going forward. The first scripture, Paul says to wives, Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. We don't like submission as a society. Feminism would say just the opposite. But Paul said, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Paul told, uh, he went on to say, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And then he turned to the husbands and he said, husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved his church and gave himself up for her. A, a sacrificial remaining by faithful to the very end, true to the promises that we made to them. Love them. Just as Jesus loves his church, wives submit to husbands, husbands love your wives, and do not move from that. 
He says, further, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Men, we are hard and calloused and brutes and don't always feel things. But he says, be tender and love. And women, since the very beginning in the garden, have desired to take away the leadership and the role that God has placed on men. And it happened with Eve, and she took that initial role, and she gave fruit that was forbidden to her husband. And yet, God is calling us back, and he's saying, women, respect your husbands. Do not speak to them in scorn. Do not rebuke them. Respect. Paul says to children, obey your parents. So I'm talking to the kids in here. I'm talking to Judah and Zion and Payson and Presley and Noah and all these kids. Obey your parents in the Lord. Paul said this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you would live long in the land. So you have the beginnings of this is a dad that doesn't have all of the tenderness that he naturally should, but, but he's called to love, and the wife that doesn't have that respect that she naturally should, but she's called to do it, and children seeing them both working in this very proactive way are underneath them in submission to it, and it forms this amazing unit that's going to change the world when we actually do it this way. He says to fathers, it's interesting, he doesn't say this to mothers, he says it to fathers, I can relate to this. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. We can be impatient. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's proactive. That, that's involved. That's me saying, I want to discipline my boys and my girl in the Lord. I want to instruct them in the way of the Lord. It's proactive and it's involved. It isn't passive and lazy and flip on the TV and leave them to do what they're doing. He goes on and he says, so I would have, listen to this. So this is Paul. I would have younger widows to marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Now, here's an interesting thing. The word for manage your household is a compound Greek word that literally means house despot. <laughs> Think on that. She has a way, and it's going to be done this way, but she's very attached and connected to the home. It literally is two words, ikos despotis, house despot. That's what he says. That's what the Bible says. Um, he goes on, and this is Titus chapter 2. He says, older men, so this is called the older men in the congregation. He says, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. What an example, what a godly, glorious example to be self-controlled, a man of, of dignity, who the people know that man is remaining true to what he's been called to do. He takes his strength and he puts it under control. And then he turns to the older women. And he says, likewise, you are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to, here's key, they are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. And then he says, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, when God made mankind, he looked on us and he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. 
part of our task that was given to us. It's, it's the very part that makes us in the image of God is to be able to produce and create life and through that life to take this chaotic, crazy world and subdue it. And specifically for the church to bring our families under the reign of Jesus Christ so that we would then take these units out into the world like little beacons that brings everything else under the reign of Christ. The call still remains. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 says, Hear this, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Now listen to this. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He's saying the word of the Lord, the desire of the Lord, the command of the Lord, make it so central, make it so deeply a part of your life that your kids see you and hear you talking about it. Everywhere you go, you walking by the wayside, you driving to Oklahoma City, you sitting down at the table, they ought to hear you speaking of the things of the Lord, the will of the Lord and his desire, because he is the reigning king. He says, even write them on your doorposts, put scripture on your walls, make it something that you can see it every day because that's what it's going to take. Those are the scriptures. Those are the words from the Lord. Now let me give you a call to action and then we'll be done. And I, I truly, I truly believe we're at a turning point societally that can be supremely valuable and good. I'm seeing 50 years down the road very optimistically. I'm seeing the reuniting of families. I'm seeing children that are raised in the instruction and the discipline of the Lord. And, and families creating not just living souls, but living souls that desire to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. I'm seeing the proverb coming true that says, raise up, train up your children in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Here's the call to action. This is very practical. Men have to lead on this. Have a family devotion every night. Every night. Don't let a day go by that you don't, as a family, have a devotion and bring your children into the word of the Lord. Number two, turn off your cell phones in the evening and engage with one another. It's a challenge for me. Husbands with wives, Parents with children, turn off the screens. Come together, play a game, interact, look each other in the eye, talk about things that matter, talk about plans and future things. These are eternal souls. We can't leave them to be raised by screens. Talk about the things of God when you're driving to Oklahoma City or Enid or wherever. So you're going down the road, say, hey, kid, whatever your kid's name is. You see that tree over there? Who made that tree? I'll say, well, God, isn't that awesome? And talk to them, work them through the profound nature that we have a God that was just able to imagine something that had literally never existed and create it in an instant. It's glorious and it's awesome. That's who we serve. I ask my boys every day, how many gods are they there? And they say, one. Judah, how many gods are there? One, the living and true God. That's right. <laughs> the living and true God. Judah, what do we do with the knowledge of Christ? That's right. Where are we going? How do we get there? How do we follow Jesus? We need the Bible. What's a marriage? One woman and one man for life. That's right. 
Make it a part of every day. I'm thinking this morning about motherhood, and I, I wrote a poem for Miranda. Get it pulled up. But this is for all mothers. And I, I see our society, one of the, you know, if we're going to take the Boniface option, I want to take my axe and swing it right to the base of this false god. The false god that has told young women that there's anything greater than producing life and raising them in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. I want to bring it right to the root of that tree. Because it is glorious. I was thinking about motherhood. Women, you, you actually literally through your bodies create eternal souls. Souls that are going to live forever. That's, there's literally no greater impact. No life exists on this earth without mothers. And, and yet we have a nation right now that's saying mothers should be able to destroy that. But this is for Miranda and for all of the mothers that do likewise. Poised, she carries a load hard to bear, graciously tending to small grubby hands. Her direction is firm toward a heavenly share, joyfully dropping vain secular plans. I hear in my home the laughter of children, the patter of small feet. I see in their faces the image of God, I watch as they leap and ride bikes in the street. I see my young boys digging holes in the sod. I marvel, confounded by the fruit of her womb. Her body made life and sustained it alone. A mother is glory, a flower in bloom. Our heavenly father is pleased from the throne. Her beauty is modest, but radiates glory. She greets distant days with a smile. She isn't concerned with a glamorous story, but her ways in the home will be praised a long while. Be mothers. Raise your kids in the instruction of the Lord. Fathers, be active. Be proactive. Lead, lead, lead. Think in terms of many, many many generations. I remember my parents telling me as a boy, you will be a Christian. You will marry a Christian. You will raise Christian children. And you will teach your children to raise Christian children. That's four generations just there that they had in mind. Think forward 10 generations. Look forward, men, look forward to say, I want my progeny to be faithful to the Lord and do what you must right now to ensure that happens. You cannot come into a strong man's house unless you first bind the strong man, Jesus said. Be the strong man that doesn't let something in the house. Men, live purely. Delete Instagram if need be. If anything lures your eyes from your bride. Live purely. Women, submit to your husbands and honor them as your spiritual head. I remember making a joke some years ago about, um, I, I was kind of being humorous about something that Peter actually says about Sarah. Now, this isn't funny because Peter's being, he's saying, women, you must be like this. And I think that we we mix up what he means by it, and so we can make jokes of it. But I think we need to get closer to this than we are now. He said, Sarah, the women of old were, you know, had this inner quiet beauty, even calling Abraham Lord. She called him Lord. It didn't mean that was her savior. There was that amount of respect for him as the leader of the family. Children, obey your parents and honor them in everything. 
Older women of our church, I'm calling you to proactively encourage and take alongside the younger women and give them wisdom from your years of experience. One of the temptations is going to be to say, well, I didn't do it the way I was supposed to do it. And so I'm not a credible, that's not true. There's actually a unique credibility that you may have if that is a temptation for you to avoid giving the instruction because you feel like maybe you didn't follow it. Go forward, the Lord will use you mightily for the next generation. Give encouragement. Paul said older women are to instruct the younger women. Being a part of the church isn't that we just come together and do the Lord's Supper and that we sing a cappella and that we baptize people. Christian fundamentalism has hurt us to the degree that we've rendered the faith down to a couple of things. We've overlooked so many supremely valuable things, like older women instruct the younger women. Men, older men, mentor the younger men. Take them alongside. Teach them to be the men that their fathers may not have taught them to be. Give them wisdom. Teach them how to be strong. It's good and okay to be masculine. And to use that for the glory of God. To use that strength and that special talent that the Lord has given for his glory. I envision, I'm looking forward 50 years. I envision that in 50 years, the little boys and the little girls in this room are going to be the elders and the elders' wives and the preachers and the preachers' wives and the deacons and the Bible class teachers and the faithful bulwark that would have so profound a faith in Jesus Christ because of years of being raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord that it, it does not matter what the enemy brings against that church. It will not move. Jesus said if we are built on the rock, the gates of hell can rail against us and we will not be moved. Nothing will move us. Let's build this. This is a call, I admit, maybe the most direct, perhaps the most challenging lesson I've ever given. But I cannot be ashamed of it. This is the word of the Lord. And what we've done societally and the way we've pursued things hasn't worked. To the degree that we can come together as families and limit outside influences, Let's do it to the very best of our ability. And let's raise a generation who loves the Lord, who knows the Lord, who will work mightily for the Lord, who remembers their covenant with their creator all the days of their lives. Amen. That's the call. And I will stand with you in this. Let's stand and sing the closing song.